Hi everyone, my name is Brian Sanchez. I'm a student here at UMass Medical School and today I'm going to be teaching you guys about addiction. Before we begin, I first want to talk about what we're going to be talking about in today's talk. So I'm going to go over six main substances, nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, opioids, psychostimulants, club drugs, and along with that I want to talk about how each of them alters our physiology and how they alter our brain. I want to start our talk off by first talking about what is addiction. The general idea of addiction is that drug abuse transforms into drug addiction, and abuse may alter the structure of various brain circuits and their chemical properties, which sets the stage for dependency. The need for the drug overwhelms any negative consequences associated with the drug-seeking behavior. So what that ha ends up happening is that there's a, um, people begin to have this tolerance and withdrawal. And that means that you get dependency when you start suffering from withdrawal symptoms when you stop using a drug. And tolerance occurs when you need a higher dose of the same drug to get the same effect from it. After all that happens, what can, your reward circuitry becomes altered and you can lose control. When someone becomes addicted to a certain substance, their reward circuits are altered. And so I want to talk a little bit more about what is the reward circuit. So the reward circuit is a group of neural structures responsible for desire or craving for a reward. And you can see that there on the slide, you can see that there are six main um, uh, neural structures that are associated with the reward circuit. And these, word, uh, and these structures all motivate animals to approach stimuli or engage in behavior that will make them happy. And you can see on the bottom left that there are three main um, neurotransmitters that are involved in the reward circuit and we're going to talk more about them later and how different drugs alter these different neurotransmitters. The first neurotransmitter is dopamine, the second one is GABA, and the third one is glutamate. Knowing that all these bad things can happen, we ask the question, why do people use drugs? And there's a lot of reasons why people could use drugs, whether it comes from pleasure to get high and, or their life is stressed and they want to get rid of the stress. They could be undergoing emotional or physical pain, uh, social pressures included. Um, people may take drugs to become more competitive at athletics, or they just want to experiment with new things. There are a multitude of factors that can lead to addiction, and I'm going to start briefly touching on them. So on one hand, we have the environmental factors, such as when a person starts taking their, the drugs, how available are they in the environment, and the cost of them. But along with those things, there can be other factors such as uh, chaotic home lives and abuse, parental use and attributes, peer influences, community attitudes, and poor school achievement. On the other side of the factors is a person's biology and genes, such as their genetics, their gender, and their, if they have any neur neural disorders. When you take into consideration about why drug addiction is such a biology and the America, environment that they are and why in, more people are looking these, for uh, new these ways factors can that lead we can drug treat use, drug addiction, which will lead to so an alter, in 2014, there was alteration a study that, that showed that 21 and million American adults, adults battled of substance use disorder. And along with that, almost 8 million Americans are battling both mental health disorders and substance use. Almost 80% of individuals suffering from substance use in 2014 struggled with alcohol use disorder. So you can see that, you know, along with so many people suffering from it, it is a huge healthcare burden to society and it costs almost $200 billion a year in uh, money used to help treat these patients with um, substance use disorders. So with all that in mind, you know, I really hope you guys are interested in learning more about it and hopefully will one day help us find new ways to treat people with substance use disorders. So now we're going to get into what are the major drug classes, what they do to our bodies, and how they alter our brains. The first major drug that we're going to be talking about is nicotine. So nicotine, as many of us know, are found in cigarettes and in some e-cigarettes. And some, here are some facts about nicotine. is that 70 million people in America are smokers, and it kills more than 440,000 um, Americans each year. So the overall cost of smoking in the United States is estimated to be 193 billion each year. And these are all very preventable deaths if people just didn't smoke. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how nicotine works. So it works through these receptors called the nicotine, nicotinic acetylene 
acetylcholine receptor and if you look at our flow chart on the left if you start at the very top when the person first gets a craving for nicotine then they begin smoking a cigarette and that will lead to an increase in nicotine and this increased nicotine can bind to these um, nicotinic acetyl uh, acetylcholine receptors and activate them and once activated they can release dopamine which is shown to the right of it and remember if we go back and I'll talk I talked about how dopamine is one of these um, neurotransmitters that are part of the reward system so it makes us feel good but the problem is that if you now go down to the bottom of the chart you can see that these activated uh, receptor now becomes a desensitized receptor and when it becomes a desensitized receptor that means that it now needs more nicotine to bind in order to get that same amount of dopamine re release which is how this cycle leads to addiction once you have these desensitized acetyl uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors so if we follow the desensitized one, it'll now become inactivated. And once you're inactivated, you now have lower levels of dopamine and you begin to get withdrawal symptoms that again will kind of lead to this addiction to nicotine because now you have low dopamine, you're not as happy and you, you're craving that happiness again. So you're gonna go straight back to cravings and the cycle will continue. There are a couple of treatments widely available now for people that do suffer from nicotine addiction and some of these treatments include nicotine gums, a transdermal patch, a nasal spray, and an inhaler, which are all equally effective and are used to re uh, relieve withdrawal symptoms. Along with that, there have been uh, a first non-nicotine prescription drug, bupropion, which is an antidepressant that has also been approved for the use of helping treat nicotine addiction. But all these drugs are great, but the problem is that none of these drugs are uh, solely effective in that these patients also need behavioral treatment such as therapy to help them in the long run overcome their addiction. The second main drug I want to talk about is alcohol. And alcohol abuse and alcoholism is a major health problem in the United States with nearly 17.6 million people abusing alcohol or are alcoholics. And one of the big problems with alcoholism is that it can lead to something called fetal alcohol syndrome, which is when a mother um, is an alcoholic and gives birth to a baby that unfortunately will have a very preventable cause uh, of mental retardation and there's no single factor or combination of factors that enable doctors to predict who will develop an addiction to alcohol but there is a role in both genetic and environmental factors when it comes to alcoholism you can see on the right hand side that there are many causes of alcoholism and there are long-term effects along with short-term effects and some of these long-term effects can be breeding problems, concentration problems, leading to people become, uh, being put in a coma, and ultimately death. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how alcohol works. So ethanol is the main ingredient in alcohol and it's actually really interesting in that alcohol is actually a depressant so it can actually reduce anxiety, tension, and limit um, behavioral inhibitions. So what this leads to is that alcohol can actually slow down our body system. Alcohol acts on M NMDA receptors, which are glutamate receptors that allow calcium into the cell in addition to sodium. And these are exci excitatory and responsible for many key cellular processes. Alcohol decreases the efficiency of these excitatory NMDA receptors and increase the inhibitor inhibitory receptors of GABA, which are chloride channels that inhibit the cells they reside on. Nalotrexone is the drug being currently developed for combating heroin addiction by blocking opioid receptors, but it also could have a possibility in treating alcoholism. The next drug I'm going to be talking about is marijuana. So what marijuana does to people who smoke it is that it distorts their perception of space, time, and self and its active ingredient is tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, which can bind uh, cannabinoid receptors. And the hippocampus contains many of these receptors, which is, and the hippocampus, as we know, is very important for learning and memory. So by binding these receptors, marijuana can then impact how our learning and memory processes function. And there has been a therapeutic effort to target the endocannabinoid system with drugs. 
Marijuana has many effects on the brain. So as I talked about earlier, there are these cannabinoid receptors that are expressed in the hypothalamus, but they're not only expressed in the hypothalamus. And that you can see that they are expressed in also the basal ganglia, ventral stradium, amygdala, your brainstem and spinal cord, cerebellum, hip, the hippocampus, and the neocortex. When the active ingredient THC in marijuana um, travels through our body, include, uh, it will go to many places including our brain and it can bind to all these different sites on our brain and affect the way we think and learn. The next class of drugs I will be talking about are opiates and you can see in the background of the slide the many different type of opiates that can be abused including heroin, morphine, codeine, fentanyl, and oxycodone. So what do these opiates do is that they increase the amount of dopamine that is released in your brain and they can mimic the effect of endogenous opioids, which are like dopamine that's in our brain to make us feel better, just naturally. And they activate our um, reward circuits to in induce a brief rush of euphoria, followed by hours of relaxation. All these drugs are extremely addictable in that previous scientific experiments in monkeys and rats show that they can become very tolerant to these drugs if given an unlimited access to both heroin heroin or morphine and that this heroin was uh, and if you inject heroin into a mice that it can reach the brain in as quickly as 15 to 20 seconds. What's important to note is that people may not only take opiates because of a drug addiction and that some people um, after a surgery may take them because of they are highly capable of pain relief but the problem is that if they become addicted that the way that these drugs work is that they are they depress our breathing and by depressing our breathing they can actually stop breathing altogether and lead to death and that there are actually certain drugs in the market now that are used to prevent against opioid addiction and that's methadone, noxalone, and um, buprenorphine. So I will now talk about how heroin works in that you can see in this picture on the slide that on the left side of the picture we have our nerve terminals, our synaptic cleft, and the dopamine receptor along with the GABA receptor. So what normally happens is that you get release of GABA from our nerve terminals that can bind to our GABA receptors and binding the GABA receptor. So if you guys remember from earlier, GABA is an inhibitory um, neuron. So it inhibits the release of dopamine into the synaptic cleft that can then bind to the dopamine receptor, which it leads to this feeling of euphoria. But on the right side, you can see what happens if we introduce heroin into the mix. So heroin is broken down into its active form of morphine, and now you get morphine that can bind to these delta or kappa opioid, opiate receptors. And these opiate receptors, just like GABA, are also inhibitory um, receptors in that they now inhibit the release of um, GABA from the nerve terminal and so now that you have less GABA in the synaptic cleft you no longer get this binding to the GABA receptor which inhibits um, dopamine from being released from the nerve terminals so now you have an excess of dopamine in your synaptic cleft that can then bind multiple dopamine receptors and lead to a high amount of euphoria the next class of drugs we will be talking about are the psychostimulants and the way these psychostimulants work is the most common psychostimulants are cocaine and amphetamines, crack, which is an altered version of cocaine that is smoked, cr and crystal meth, which is also smoked. All of these drugs that I have just mentioned are extremely addictive, and experiments in rats have shown that these rats will self-administer these drugs even when the process involves a harmful stimulant. So that means that they'll shock themselves repeatedly just so they can receive these drugs, which to me is just insane that they're that these drugs are so good that they're willing to put themselves in pain to constantly keep getting. The mechanism behind how these drugs works is that they elevate our brain dopamine levels and increase motivation to take these drugs. Eventually what happens is that people that take these drugs eventually have something called the cocaine crash, which is up after uh, having cocaine, they experience emotional and physical exhaustion along with depression and this is because of a shutdown in dopamine and or serotonin function. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, the mechanism behind cocaine works and you can see the way that it works is that 
in this picture, so these orange balls are dopamine, right? And the way dopamine normally is, is that it's released from these nerve terminals that can then um, go to these uh, synapses and then produce euphoria. But what happens is that they'll eventually be recycled in that they'll go back into these dopamine transporters. And then these dopamine transporters will tell the um, synaptic uh, terminal, the nerve terminal, I mean, that it's time to stop releasing dopamine, that there's enough in the system and you don't have to release anymore. But now if you introduce cocaine to the mix, is what happens is that cocaine can actually bind these dopamine transporters and by binding these transporters, dopamine can no longer bind to them and that now tells um, our neuron that we can keep releasing dopamine because I haven't had any dopamine bind to my dopamine transporter and that means that this, our body needs more dopamine. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the physiology behind people who take cocaine and that when you take cocaine what happens is that it increases your sympathetic nervous system output and increases your uh, catecholamine output. So what this means is that your sympathetic nervous system is part of your fight or flight response and that it's mainly part it works to increase your heart rate, blood pressure, and contractility, and that gets you excited more. So what happens is that when you get all these excitatory things come up is that your oxygen demand in your cells will increase. But at the same time, on the other side, you get coronary spasms and vasoconstriction and an increase of platelet adherence and thrombus. So all those things will lead to a decrease in your oxygen supply. So what happens is that you get an increase in the amount of oxygen you need, but a decrease in the amount of oxygen you have in yourself. And that can lead to something called uh, ischemia, which is also the death of your um, cells, right? So you get ischemia, infarction, and then that will ultimately lead to your death because your cells just died because you have an, a higher amount of oxygen that your cells need to survive, but also at the same time, you have a lower amount of your oxygen supply. Along with the sympathetic nervous system output, what can also happen is that you get a decrease in your sodium transport, which it will lead to this local anesthetic effect, so you won't feel the area in which the cocaine has been applied. And these things can ultimately lead to arrhythmia, which is a problem with your heart. So what will happen if you uh, get arrhythmia is that your heart can either be too fast, too slow, or with an irregular rhythm, and that can also lead to a person's death. The last group of drugs that I'm going to be talking to you guys about today are these club drugs. So these club drugs are known, are more commonly known as ecstasy, herbal ecstasy, rohypnol, and ketamine. And these drugs, um, people, they're called club drugs because people usually take them at raves and other places where it's very high energy because when you're on them, you feel like you have this uh, insane increase of stamina, but you don't really, it's just, it's changing the alterations of your physiology. And the problem with these drugs is that they can actually do very serious damage to your brain. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit more about the two main drugs and their effects. So the first main drug is MDMA, also known as ecstasy. So this is a synthetic psychoactive drug, meaning that it's made in a laboratory and it alters your um, physiological state and that you can start to begin to hallucinate and see things that aren't really there. Along with this, there are chronic use um, that affects thought, memory, and pleasure areas. The second key players are depressants, and these are three main drugs, rohypnol, GHB, and ketamine. And these are really scary drugs because they're also known as state rate drugs. And this is because when they are mixed with alcohol, rohypnol can in, uh, ca incapacitate victims and prevent them from resisting sexual assault. And they're also colorless, tasteless, and odorless. We're going to dive a little bit more into the depressants, more specifically GHB and ketamine. So GHB stands for gamma hydroxy uh, butyric acid. And when people are on GHB, they have this sense of euphoria. They're sedative, so they're not as active as they were before. And it's an anabolic drug, and it's used um, for accelerated bo bodybuilding, actually. But the problem with it is that it's also implicated in many sexual assaults because of its sedative effects. The other um, depressant is ketamine, which is a fast-acting uh, general anesthetic drug, and it induces a state of reversible loss of consciousness. So you're kind of woozy while you're on ketamine, and it's, uh, like I said, it's sedative, hypnotic, and it's also used in general medicine. So I don't know if anybody's seen the TV show House, but 
um, it was actually a drug use in the TV show where Dr. House had leg pain and he was using it to get him off Vicodin. So this is the end of my lecture and I just wanted to leave you guys with one last thing where if you guys are more interested in learning about these different drugs that I talked about or if something didn't quite make sense to you about the mechanism of action, there's this great website um, called Mouse Party that I've left up here that you guys can all go to and it's really informative. It's an interactive website where you guys can just learn more about different drugs and how they alter our brain states. So thank you everyone.